Okay, I think we're about ready to begin again. I think I've seen some of you people before. Huh? Yeah, nice. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is our um, quarterly exhibit. The title of uh, this uh, go around is Preserving the Past Coal Camps and Coal Company Houses. Jerry Longshack and myself uh, are hosting this, this exhibit, and it's really tied to the renovation of the miner's house, uh, the 1908 miner's house that Jerry's going to be talking about. Um, before we begin, though, um, I'd like to pause a moment. Uh, most recently, the um, museum lost a dear, dear friend. And that's Mrs. Uh, Dolores Albertini, and she passed away on Wednesday. If most of you know that Dolores and Virgil were great supporters of the Miner's House Project, and Dolores was always excited to hear any news about what phase we were in, and any items, any new items that were added. And in one of their last conversations, she encouraged Virgil to be here for this event. So Virgil, on behalf of uh, the board at Miners Hall Museum and the entire, really, uh, museum family, uh, please accept our heartfelt con condolences to you during this, this difficult time. But be assured, through her many good works, generous and kind nature, Dolores' spirit lives on, and it certainly will live on here. Thank you, Virgil. <laughs> Coal Company Houses. Well, many of you might recall they were rickety structures, easily knocked down and set up again, or put on wheels and moved across to different counties. They were not insulated, and they were poorly ventilated. And they really weren't comfortable in the winter nor the summer. <laughs> you would think that the coal companies would have spent a little more time in building some of these structures, but they, they tended to be a little lax. In fact, I read uh, one report that a mule shed of an old camp was uh, found to be transformed into a miner's living quarters at a new camp. <laughs> so unlike urban areas, rather than eth work, work, rather than ethnicity, determine community here in southeast Kansas. Living in the camps brought about sharing of traditions and cultures across ethnic lines. These people established from those connections permanent homes, schools, churches. They built towns and hamlets. Dr. Powell called them hamlets, the camps that turned into little hamlets. I love that. So today when we celebrate our 115-year-old coal company house, just kind of recall that it is a testament to the deep immigrant roots that we uh, have established here, that our, that our ancestors have established here in southeast Kansas. And in order to really supply a wonderful history of that program, we have two, two presenters today. You all know Jerry Lomshack. He uh, is not only a great recorder of our local history, but he also is a preserver of our architecture. I like to equate Jerry with that guy in the westerns with the white hat that rides into town and says, I'm, I'm going to save your town. Well, I think he kind of did that. You know, he pretty humble. He won't say he did it alone, but I think Chicopee is a testament to that. So Jerry's going to talk about that. And we have special guest Virgil Albertini, who happened to live next door to 107 North Depot Street, actually shared some of the family history of this miner's house that we now have located here. So I'm going to turn this over right now. Please welcome uh, Jerry and, and Virgil. Thank you, Linda. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank Linda because if it wasn't for Linda, we wouldn't have this quarterly exhibit. She's just remarkable on how she can put, put together one of these exhibits. Also want to acknowledge that she herself is a great historian um, as well, a great person and a good friend. Um, 
tell you a little bit about myself, those of you that don't know me. I am a local historian, and I particularly have concentrated on the Chicopee, Kansas area, which that'll show up during this talk, because I'll talk a lot about Chicopee here. Uh, but I've looked at all aspects of history here in southeast Kansas, and I always think that it's one of the most colorful histories in the state of Kansas, probably, and it's unique in the state of Kansas. It's not like any other part of the state. First, i uh, talk just a short uh, explanation about company houses itself. There's basically three reasons for why those came about. One was they was built uh, by the major coal companies. The really big ones would build uh, these company houses, and they would build them near to the mine so that because of the problems of transportation at that time, that the miners would be close to work there, and they could just walk, walk to work in the mornings. The other one was that there was ready housing then, particularly for the immigrant population coming in here, that they could go directly to a company house and, and have living quarters there. The other thing, um, uh, just as a sideline, it was also a source of income for the coal company, you know, as well. The different coal companies had different designs for their company houses. And some of those designs changed over, uh, over time. It was not always the same. And a lot depended on who the uh, contractor was that was building those houses. There was two-room houses, there was three-room houses, and there was four-room houses. Uh, I just saw a reference re recently that the four-room houses sometimes were for the pit boss. You know, he had a little better accommodations than the common, the common miners. And often the coal company would build multiple houses at one time. Um, here is probably one of the earliest pictures that I've found of company houses, and this is at Chicopee. Chicopee, uh, the first houses there were built in the uh, uh, summer of 1887. They built 10 houses and a boarding house. And then the next year, in 1888, the company built 20 company houses. And I think these are those 20 company houses. And you see they're just like all in a row there on both sides of the street. And those are all two-room houses, just very small houses there. <laughs> like I said, they would build up to 10 or 20 at a time. So it was kind of amazing how much building was going on with that. Uh, there were at least 90 coal camps across the coal fields here, and that would be the eastern part of Crawford County and the northern part of Cherokee County. And during that time, during the deep mine, uh, coal mining era, there were about 290 major coal mines across the coal fields here. Some of those camps serve more than one mine. They're, the coal company may have multiple mines just close by, and so they just had one coal company. Uh, as an example, Chicopee had uh, three, coal, uh, three coal mines, major coal mines around the town of Chicopee. Frontenac had at least six around that, them so that they would all live there. And just to give you an idea of the number of coal camps that were here, I, again, I'll use the Chicopee example. At Chicopee, uh, three-fourths of a mile to the southeast was another coal camp called Cambria. And that was run by the Central Coal and Coke Company, which was a large uh, mining operation. Uh, half mile east of Cambria was the uh, coal camp of Kirkwood, named after Archibald Kirkwood, for the uh, Ware Coal Company. And one mile south of Chicopee was the uh, coal camp of Ashley, or Camp 15, which again was with the uh, Central Coal and Coke Company. And two miles to the southwest of Chicopee was the, the coal camp of Fleming, and it belonged to the Western Coal Company. So you can see there within just two miles how many uh, possible coal camps there might be. Now let's concentrate a little bit on our own miner's house here at the museum. This house has a long and varied history. It's a small three-room house. And it was built by the Cherokee and Pittsburgh Coal and Mining Company. That was the coal branch of the Santa Fe Railroad. 
the, the Cherokee and Pittsburgh had mines at Chicopee and Frontenac, and like I say, you know, my background is from the Chicopee area. There was a lot of interaction there between Chicopee and Frontenac for that reason, because they both belong to the same coal company. And I see a lot of families that would move from one, from Chicopee to Frontenac, or Ch Frontenac to Chicopee and back and forth, and I have a lot of information about those families. Here, uh, thanks to Seth Nutt in Frontenac, uh, we have these pictures here. These were taken in 1910, and you can see the company houses here lined up on both sides of the street, and they're exactly like our uh, miner's house out in the back here. So these were all probably built about the same time. There's another picture of it again. This was taken at a, a Odd Fellows uh, Parade there in Frontenac in 1910, and you can see the coal, uh, the company houses up there in the back. This one I might point out to you. Houses get remodeled and redesigned, and in that case, that one has been added to where there's a, a side addition to that house back there. There again is in 1910 with that parade, and there's a couple of those houses, and you see the one on the uh, far left there, it, it was probably a three-room house where it has a side addition to it there. But the one on the right there is exactly like our house out here at the museum. The first evidence of the house that we have here, the miner's house, uh, is in 1908. It, that's when it appears on the tax rolls. That was something that I learned is that Crawford County has tax rolls since the beginning of the county in 1869, and so you can track a, property, a piece of property from that time clear up to the present. It was located at the east half of Block 2, Lot 3, in the original town of Frontenac, which, as Linda said, was 107 North Depot Street. Now that, that, that street's name has been changed to Lynn Street, but it would be 107 North Lynn Street, it, which is about a, where it set was about a half a block north of McKay, which is the main street there in Frontenac. I believe that it, uh, it undoubtedly, our house here it predates uh, that date. Some, I found some mention that it was built in 1906 but I find no source for that. I found you know, it's kind of a verbal history that it was built in 1906. I think it may even pre uh, predate that, that time. In 1906, the lot where it stood was vacant, so it was not at that site at that time. The co what, reason why I think it was older than that was the coal company would not have built the house and then sold it right away. It would have been built for the miners and been rented out uh, as a miner's house for a period of time before the company finally decided to sell it. It may have been built around the turn of the century. Some of the things that helped to date the house is that it had plastered walls. The older houses in the 1880s, 1890s would have had wooden walls and not plastered. Uh, also, uh, in the 1890s they were using square nails rather than round nails like we have today. And when we were remodeling this house, we did find a few square nails, but not very many. So we think that it was more than likely probably built around the turn of the century. The Cherokee in Pittsburgh bought this lot on Depot Street or Lynn Street in 1888 when Frontenac was pretty well founded and platted. But it appears on the tax records to be vacant until 1908 when this house shows up there on that lot. It was probably moved there that year from some other place. I continue to keep researching that and that's trying to find a needle in a haystack is to find out history about one particular house <laughs> in, in, a, in a community. You can find it but it takes a lot of time to do that. The earliest resident that we have record of is the Mrs. Ewells. When it was sold in 1909 it said that uh, Mrs. Ewells had lived there previously. 
Now, I've researched a little bit on Mrs. Yules, and there's two possibilities here. There was a Nancy Gross Yules that died in Frontenac in 1905, and it may be her, but that's about four years before it was sold, and so it's kind of questionable whether they would have mentioned that she lived there four years later. There was a John and Florence Yules that lived in Frontenac at that time, and he was a coal miner. And he was living on Depot Street in 1901, but not in that house, unless it got moved. But it, it was close by to where that house was, but not in that house. In the uh, Pittsburgh Daily Headlight at that time, there would be a column about Frontenac every week. And those are really interesting articles that come out, and they would tell you everything that was going on in town for the past week. And they would tell you who went shopping and everything, <laughs> who was born, who died, and everything else about it. But on the 20th of March, 1909, in the Pittsburgh Daily Headline, it says, C. Benelli has purchased a resident property of the Cherokee and Pittsburgh Coal Company, formerly occupied by Mrs. Ewells. And then uh, the next, uh, uh, next month, it was recorded that uh, among the uh, uh, deed transfers on the 19th of April, 1909, but he actually, I, when I saw the deed, uh, Carlo Benelli had bought that property on the 23rd of March, 1909 from the Cherokee in Pittsburgh. Uh, when they uh, sold, there were several others in the north part of Frontenac that was sold at the same time. This house sold for $800. <laughs> Carlo, at the time, was 72 years old. Carlo, or Charles as he was sometimes called, was born in 1837 in Barreto uh, in the Reggio Emilia province of Italy, in northern Italy. And he was married to Gudita, who later on was called Julia. It's always interesting how, how names get anglicized here. Uh, her name was Molencina in 1868. They was married in 1868, and she was born in 1844, also in Barreto. Carlo uh, immigrated here in 1887, and he was a coal miner. Gudita came with the family in 1890, three years later, when he had you know, gathered enough money to, to bring the family over. In, 19, in 1891, they were living in Litchfield, which was a mining camp as well. By 1901, they were in Frontenac. They had seven children, and I have to tell you their names because they're such neat names. Uh, there was Elvina. Elvina married Nick Simeon, and for those of you who know a little history of this area, Nick Simeon had the steamship uh, ticket office here in Pittsburgh for a number of years. Alcida Orfeo, he was called Chiti for some reason, I don't know why, uh, was one of the sons. Sigismondo was another son. Pompey de, Cer uh, de Cedero, he became a jeweler, an optometrist, and some of you that are older remember uh, Dr. Benelli in Pittsburgh that was an ophthalmologist, and that was a descendant of Pompey. Esterina was another daughter. Uh, Giomondo was another son, and Arduvina, she was the only one born in the U.S. in, in 1893 out of the children. In 1910, Carlo and family were living two blocks west on Labette Street, so even though he had bought that the year before, they did not live in the house. They owned it, but they didn't live there. Carlo died in 1913, and he's buried at Mount Carmel Cemetery in Frontenac. In 1910, the son Acida, Acida and wife Millie, or Nelly, I'm sorry, Nelly, was living in the house. So the son and his wife lived there. In 1926, Gudita sold the house to Alcide and Nelly, and Gudita died in 1931 and was buried by her husband there in Frontenac. In 1928, Alcide and Nelly sold the house to Roseanne uh, Bickerdeck, Bickerdike, I'm sorry. She was born in 1863 in England, and her maiden name was Isaacs. She married Charles E. Bickerdike in 1882, 
In the 1900s, she and Charles were living in Galena. Charles was born in 1858, but he died in 1937 in California, so I don't know if they were separated or divorced or what, because she stayed here. In 1941, Rose sold to her daughters uh, Myrtle and Winnie, and Myrtle lived here in the house for a while after that. Rose died in 1953 and is buried at Highland Park Cemetery at Pittsburgh. In 1962, Myrtle and Winnie sold the house to Winnie's children. And in 1966, those children sold it to Joseph Friscoll, uh, who lived across the street from the house. During that time, there was a Josiah, that's not the popular Josiah, it was another Josiah, that uh, lived in that house in the early 1960s to the early uh, 1970s. In 1976, the house moved to Pittsburgh on Broadway at 2nd Street and became the information center for the U.S. Bicentennial. Ed McNally paid to have the house renovated at that time, and Ron Palmier, uh, our uh, collection manager here at the museum, his father did the work on that house. It's interesting. One thing I've learned about uh, uh, researching history is life is pretty much interconnected, you know, and it's amazing the cross connections that you see, whether that's over a period of time or whether that's spatially or whatever, you know, there's all kinds of inter interconnections there. After the bicentennial, the house was moved to North Joplin Street, about a half block north of 4th Street on the east side. And there it was used as a beauty shop and later the office for a pest control business. In 2004, Richard Jameson was the owner of the house and he donated it to Sacred Heart Catholic Church and it was moved back to Frontenac on uh, South Cherokee Street behind Sacred Heart Church and the Catholic School there with the intent of creating a small museum, but that never uh, materialized. Here uh, was when we were getting ready to move it and you'll see that there's uh, the Sacred Heart School right there to the right side uh, and the foundation where it stood there before we moved it. In 2012, the, the church donated the house to Miners Hall Museum here through the efforts of Vita Maxwell. She at the time was a board member here for the museum uh, and it was through her uh, efforts that, w that we were able to acquire the house and it was moved to Franklin where it is today, here behind the museum. There's a picture of it coming down uh, 69 Highway there. It was amazing that a pickup truck's pulling it, pulling it down here. You know. Now I want to show you the difference in time here. This is a house moving operation. <laughs> <laughs> In 1910 at Weir, and notice the road, what a beautiful road it is, you know. <laughs> and notice where it's sitting on this wagon that it's a little bent, you know, the house is a little bent there. <laughs> In uh, 2017, we began the restoration of the house. Here's what it looked like when we first got it here. Uh, we acquired nearly $50,000 from grants and some very generous donors, namely Virgil and Dolores Albertini. If it wasn't for them, this house would have, would have not been restored. Ken Peak also gave major donations. My brother Dave also gave some major donations for it. And without them, the house would have never been redone. Restoration of the house was done by Frank uh, Buderak and James Lawson. There's, uh, on the left, is when Frank was working on the house and had stripped off a lot of the siding and was redoing that. And this, over on the right side, it was the last uh, part of the restoration when James uh, Lawson added the back steps to the house. And there's what it looks like today. The interior is furnished representing the era of 1910. And the furnishings were no donated by John and Linda Russell, uh, Ken Peake, JT and Linda Knoll, and Anna and I. 
and we tried to keep it in, in that uh, time period of 1910. And with that, I want to uh, turn this over to Virgil and let him give you some observations that he has since he lived next to that house there. Um, Virgil was a professor emeritus of English from Northwest Missouri State at Maryville, Missouri. He was awarded as an outstanding educator and he taught at Northwest for over 30 years and authored works on the author, American author Willa Cather and also on American realism literature. In his youth, like I said, he lived next door to the miner's house, so I'll let uh, Virgil discuss that a little bit with you. Oh, thank you, Jerry. I mean, you said many things there that I often wondered about, and now they fall in place for me. Oh. Uh. Uh, and I want to thank the museum for what all of they've done in bringing that house back because it restores, brings back many of my own memories because whenever I come here, I can go over and look at it and just kind of reminisce. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank Linda and Jerry especially because their work has been exemplary. It's just been marvelous. I mean, you did outstanding work. And my, Dolores and I would really appreciate that. Now, as I told Linda when she asked me about giving this little talk, she said, off the cup. Now, this is off the cup, a little disjointed. I took a few little notes because of some things I don't want to forget, okay? <laughs> Depot Street. I was a, I was just a little tyke when my parents bought that house, bought a house, and moved there. This is what Depot Street was like. I didn't know it then because I was just a little tyke. I didn't understand. But as I grew older, I want to tell you about Depot Street. I wish it were still named Depot Street because it just it just captured the flavor of the whole street. Up on the corner from where we lived just happened to be Peepish Tavern. Some of you people might remember that, which is okay, quite enough. Next to that house was uh, Paul and Bob Frisco's grandparents. And then came the Frisco house, which used to be the old post office in Frontenac. And next to that one was a little house uh, where one of the grandparents lived also. Next to that house, the grandparents of the Frisco's had a rooming house. And man, when I got older, that was a thrill because always about three or four uh, widowers or bachelors used to board there, okay? And I used to always enjoy talking to them. Then another little house. Going up the street behind the post office, elderly woman lived there, used to always sit on her porch swing. Next to that was a telephone office. And the telephone office was a thriving place. It was open 24 hours and employed young ladies and so forth. And whenever you wanted to make a call or so forth, you... <laughs> You always had to be careful because you knew they were listening, okay? So, <laughs> and uh, next to that house then was the Benelli house that Jerry talked about by Chidi and Nellie Benelli, okay? Always thought that rhymed so well. <laughs> Nellie was a good person. Chidi did not understand much English. Huh. Chidi was a, was a district judge. <laughs> and on Sunday afternoon, it would get kind of lively at times because the highway patrol would bring speeders over there and Chidi would hold court. And it, the talk around Frontenac, and Jack probably heard it too, is that Chidi would always say, I know, your, I know your grandfather, I know your father, I know your mother, that'd be $50, please. <laughs> <laughs> and next door was my parents' house. I must tell you, I thought it was a big house compared to that one, that's for sure, okay? And next door there was the lumber yard, Calhoun Lumber, the lumber yard, and that was a thriving place. What a playground it was for the Friscals and the Hutsies and so forth for us after hours, the big sand pile and you name it. And of course, then right next to my parents' house, Nestle End, was the Bickerdite house. I must admit, I never knew it was a miner's house until you people came along and told me it was a miner's house. All I knew was Mrs. Bickerdite, an elderly woman lived there. And I told Linda, you can't disassociate the house from Mrs. Bickerdite, that's for sure. Uh, she was a strong-minded uh, woman, uh, kind of bossy and so forth, but never really talked, never really came out of the house except to go to church. Or this, what I forgot, 
It was named Depot Street because the depot was just to the left of us, not very far away. I enjoyed it so much because sometime at nighttime, when the guy who took care of the trains would put the train away, I'd come and he'd let me sit there right next to him as he put the train away, okay? So, but anyway, my mother used to always get a little upset because the freight train used to uh, cause a lot of smoke, which would descend on her laundry, okay? So, <laughs> anyway, I asked Bob, uh, the, the two Friscos who lived just up the street, Paul and Bob, they were my dear friends. Paul was really my best friend of all time, okay? But, uh, uh, I asked Bob one time, because he used to sit on the porch swing and uh, uh, read, if he ever remembered Mrs. Mrs. Bickerdite. And he said, all I remember is her maybe going to church or what have you. And I asked Carol Didier, you know, what she remembered, because she was a pillar of the church. She said, all I remember is she came to church, she was faithful, and she was a pillar, okay? Now, back to Depot. The Depot itself was kind of exciting, too, because Every morning about 10 o'clock, every afternoon about 2 o'clock, Sheeney, the guy who was a depot manager, used to put the mail that came in on the trains on that thing and push that big cart up to the post office every morning, every afternoon. And that's when Mrs. Bickerdike came out of the house. She'd go up in the morning, she'd go up in the afternoon to check her mail. I must admit, I was probably in that house maybe only about two or three times in my lifetime. Maybe a little bit more when the daughter came to live. But I thought, gee, it's so small. You entered the front door, there was a little cot over to the right side. There was a cedar chest somewhere close by. Over to the left was a small bedroom, and then there was a kitchen. <laughs> if you want to call it that, it was so small. And I think my mother told me, this is where, that's where Mrs. Bickard and I used to take her baths. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, the old wash tub, put it out there on Saturday afternoon, take your bath there. She didn't have an indoor uh, bathroom facility. The, the outhouse was out in the back. Maybe I'd see her go out there once in a while. I don't know, but I wouldn't <laughs> pay attention to that. But that, that's enough. I just want to tell you what the house was like when I grew up. Okay. I didn't, uh, as I said, I didn't know that it was a miner's house. Okay. All I knew about Mrs. Bickerdite and living there, and it's kind of uh, rather primitive. I knew that she had two daughters and a son, and a son would come down from Kansas City with his wife and two daughters, uh, maybe about every six weeks. I do know that she feuded with the Benellis. Hmm. <laughs> Quietly. I didn't know that until, <laughs> until my dad told me because Mrs. Bickerdite once in a while would come out and sit on her swing. The Benellis would be, be on their swing. And it, the, their house was like, from me and Jack and Kay here sitting here in the front row. There was a little ditch. It must have been four inches wide and two inches deep. Do you know that they feuded over that ditch where it belonged to? <laughs> <laughs> and Mrs. Bickett and I come and sit on her porch, the Benelli's on their porch, and they, they never talked to each other. Never talked to each other, okay? Well, that's, that, that's, that's a little bit of flavor about Depot Street, okay? All right. Now, darkness, that was an ever story. You never saw light in that house. She never turned the lights on at night. Okay, she went to bed early, but she used to always listen to H.V. Caltonborn. I think he was a what, a British broadcaster and so forth. And then one night, I remember so vividly, because I think I went to bed early. I had my bedroom window open. She had hers open. Here is Caltonborn saying, well, he said, when you wake up in the morning, he said, we'll have a new president. His name is Thomas Dewey. <laughs> well, we woke up the next morning, found out it was Harry Truman. <laughs> My dad didn't let that go because he could tease a little bit. He used to tease Mrs. Bickerdike because she was an avid Republican and she loved Thomas Dewey, okay? I don't think, I don't think she ever really got over that, okay? All right. But, you, you know, as, as I grew older, I become more aware of all my surroundings. There was a nice plot of ground. I don't know what Jack remembers. Marilyn probably remembers it. Uh, plot of ground between Mrs. Bickerdite's and my folks' place. That was kind of my playground, okay? But unfortunately, she had a row of flowers that separated our place from her place. And when I played, I was not supposed to go near those flowers. I think I told Linda they were iris or what we used to call flags, I think. And I just hated those flowers. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to cut her grass. I know, I don't know how she thrived. I know she didn't have much money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And occasionally, she'd want to give me a nickel. 
and this was a push mower with the rotary blade, okay? So, and uh, I continued to cut her grass, even later when I, well, that's another story, but uh, anyway. Uh, now, I gotta tell you, when I was playing out there one Sunday afternoon, I gotta associate the little playground next to her house with the house. I was out there playing one afternoon. I don't know where the Friscos were. I don't know where Paul Hutsey was. He was about four or five years older than I, but he lived just across the middle on the next street, and he'd come over quite a bit. I was by myself. I said, okay, I'm gonna play. I wanna play football. I wanna play Notre Dame against uh, Army, okay? <laughs> and so at the halftime, my halftime, the score was 40 to nothing. <laughs> well, guess who was ahead? Yeah, Notre Dame. <laughs> My mother came out on the front porch. She called me over, and I ran over, and it was a pleasant Sunday afternoon. I think it was in the fall. Well, it had to be wintertime. Yeah, we wintertime, but it was cold. It just happened to be December the 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, Virgil, the Japanese just attacked Pearl Harbor. I think I was indifferent. I don't know. It didn't mean anything to me. I, just, I think I might have shrugged my shoulders and said so, or something like that. What did it mean to me? It just explained to me that we would be at war and my two older brothers would, would go, okay? Then I think I went over to Mrs. Bigger. I, I don't remember, I'm sure that I did, knocked on the door and, and told her. I don't remember what the response was. Of course, it was probably pretty quiet, but I remember that. You know how we mark historical, uh, his, uh, historical events with our own lives, we remember certain things? I've never forgotten that day. Now, here's another little story, too. The uh, son, who used to come down to see her occasionally on a, on a, on a weekend, uh, I was either whenever I was in grade school or high school or college or whatever, used to bring his wife and two daughters. The two daughters were uh, older than I, maybe five or six years old, I don't remember. They were accomplished musicians. One played the cello, one played the violin. I attempted the piano. I was not very good at it, but I, t I could probably get past maybe Katie did in the cricket, and that was about it, okay? <laughs> but anyway, I used to have to practice extra hard because tell me, she told me, Jean and Gertrude are coming, and they want to know how you're progressing. So they would come, and I would have to play for them, and I was always embarrassed because, again, I was not very good. I want you to know that those two granddaughters, when they grew up later, one played the cello and one played the violin for the Kansas City Philharmonic, uh -huh. which is the Kansas City Symphony now. And then later, when, uh, when I taught at Northwest Missouri, the symphony used to come to our campus once a year. And Dolores and I just relished intermission because we would go up and have a great chat and so forth, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. And then, uh, of course, the one daughter died, the one granddaughter died, the next one, continue to live on in Kansas City, in North Kansas City. And we kept her a prize, a pra a prize, I guess. Mm -hmm. What's the right word, John? A prize or a prize? We kept her, yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we kept her a prize of what was going on here. And our wish, Doris, our wish was to pick her up someday and to bring her down here so she could see the house, what you were doing. Unfortunately, she got sick on us and she died here oh, just a couple years ago. Okay, so, but anyway. That's the story on that, the Bickerdite house, about, about what went on there and about how the granddaughters used to come down. So, now, one day, the granddaughter told me, I, just a few years ago, talked about Mr. Bickerdite. She said, I don't know, sometime, whenever it was, in the 30s. You said he died in 37 or something uh -huh, like that. Yeah. She said, sometime in the 30s, he just picked up and left. He just left went to California. Yeah. And she said, I don't know whatever happened. I don't know whatever happened. To it. Well, you found out he died out there. Uh -huh, so, died yeah. out there. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Anyway, so, uh, well, anyway, Mrs. Bicker died again. My mother was good to her, very good to her, I guess. And she'd bring over fresh produce from the garden. And one day she brought some beans over, freshly picked beans. You know, Mrs. Bicker died, said to my mother, are they cleaned? Are they stemmed? <laughs> and my mother said, no. She said, well, I don't want them then. <laughs> and my dad used to kind of help out a little bit. Of course, the house was not 
modernized this, but later they put in an indoor bathroom. Mm. Okay, mm. I, I don't remember what year that was. Whether Mrs. Bickerdite was still alive or not, I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't remember. But anyway, I do know that I think it was in. You said she died in '53 or somewhere uh, thereabouts and so uh -huh. forth. I think I was probably off teaching in Western Kansas at the time, and uh, but I do know. Uh, there was a complete change as far as that house is concerned. Myrtle, the daughter, came to live. Years before that, she lived in a sanatorium in Parsons. She was of ill health. Once in a while, she'd come back and visit her, her, uh, her mother. That caught by the door, I'm sure that's where she slept. Mm -hmm. Okay, where she slept. After Mrs. Bickard died, Myrtle moved in permanently. I would say probably from 53 until Myrtle died in 66. Yeah, and the lights were on. Myrtle never came out of the house very much herself, but she liked my mother. My mother liked her. Uh, in fact, before, I, be, yeah, uh, that, that, that's another story. Uh, but, well, I guess that's just about it. I was associated with that house from the time that we moved there in 1935 until until Myrtle died, in, I guess 65 or 66. Mm. And I remember the uh, the. Uh, daughter-in-law, not the daughter-in-law, but her, uh, yeah, daughter-in-law and the two granddaughters came down to the funeral, which had just happened to be in town that weekend. I was teaching at Northwest at the time, around 1966, and I remember we having a good visit, and they came over and used my, my dad's bathroom, uh, etc. So, hmm. anyway, uh, I don't know what else to say, except my, Dolores, my wife Dolores loved Depot Street, she loved Fronac. She loved the immigrant flavor, and she loved that house, where she loved my folks' house, and she loved my dad. In fact, she always thought, she wished that I would have got a position at Pittsburgh State, we would have come back, and we would have lived in that house, okay? So, mm -hmm. But of course, it never happened. In fact, that house now, let me tell you, if you guys move it back to Depot Street, <laughs> I'll come there and live, okay? <laughs> That's what you've done to it, okay? <laughs> That's what you've done to it. Well, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm through saying what I want to say. Uh, I don't think I've skipped anything. I guess we were associated with the house a little longer than the time she died because we'd come back and see my dad about every month or about every six weeks. And I do know that for a while there, after Myrtle died, a city cop moved in there. And can you believe this? That guy was a single guy. He had three or four little kids. Mm -hmm. Three or four little kids and a guy living there. Mm -hmm. Didn't live there too long. And that's when the elderly Josiah oh, moved, in. moved in. Right. Uh -huh. He lived there for a few years and he died. And I used to come down, when I cut my dad's grass, too, and I would go over and cut his grass. He was just an older gentleman that minded his own business and uh -huh. just cat th sat there and talked to me. He was appreciative his grass was good. Okay, so. Uh -huh. So I guess it all ended, I say, with me until, until you guys picked it up and took hold of it and made it what it is today. And that will always be appreciated. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you got any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. John? Yeah. <laughs> you knew I was going to say something. Didn't you? <laughs> I, I have uh, Three comments, a question for Roger, a question for you, and a comment to begin. First of all, you are a role model for anybody who wants to be an English professor. <laughs> and informative. You are a true raconteur. So the, the question for you is, when you were mowing that lawn, were you channeling your inner gem bench when you used to go and spend those afternoons with Mrs. DeBose reading to her? Remember, he had knocked the flowers off of her tree, and that was what he had to do. Do you remember To Kill a Mockingbird? Yes, I remember that so well. In fact, I cut some of her flowers down one day. <laughs> I knew you would confess. Yeah, I finally said, the heck with it. I just cut my mother didn't take to that very well. <laughs> I, I don't know whether Mrs. Bickard had ever said anything to me or not. I don't know, but my mother did not take to that very well. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I want you to know this. When I taught in Iola High School, 
one of my students right here, Lois Amershack. She's sitting right here. I had her in sophomore English. How's that? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> and then I had a question for Roger. Were any of Jerry. these miners' houses prefab? No, they no. They were all built on site. Built, uh, they built on like site. They were Sears catalog no, houses. No, uh, no. They were built on site. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I thank wonder, you, Virgil. Yeah, thank you. I, I wonder if, Jack, do you remember anything about Miner's House? Do you remember Mrs. Bickerdite's house? Of course, you oh, lived yeah. a couple blocks. Oh, oh, when I was a little kid, I always liked to go down to, to uh, Depot Street because the Friscals were there. Yeah. And there was always something going on. They had the backyard where they played baseball because yeah. they had sheds and they had holes in this window. Exactly, and yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, right, it was a right, circle. right. I was, I was so, I was young, but I went down there all the time. Well, the, the Crumsick house is there now across the street yeah. from my folks, but that used to be a meadow there, a meadow, and Paul Hutsey just, just lived close there. Paul used to come over quite often too, and when I was a kid, we used to go over there, I used to go over there and we'd play basketball with Hutsey, he was older and et cetera. And I remember, I always looked forward, and one night I couldn't go. My mother wouldn't let me go because she found out that I missed a word on the spelling test. <laughs> <laughs> now, Marilyn over here, she, she was close to, uh, close to the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether Marilyn remembers anything about Depot Street. I know one of my hangouts was her dad's filling station just up the corner, and my big hangout was a Frisco funeral parlor because of the Friscos, okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Marilyn? Anything? No, okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thank you for, yes. Well, I'm currently associated with the Friscals. I know Joe and Jim, and I know John Didier, and some different people that I've met through them. Can you share something about the Friscals as far as uh, what the lineage is? Who's who? I, I don't know, really. Well, John Frisco had the funeral parlor. He had, he had these children, uh, Art, who became a doctor, Phil, who became a brother, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Joe became a undertaker. Uh, Tip uh, married Paul Hutsey. Tip died about two years ago. Okay, and uh, uh, Paul, who was also a mortician, had a funeral parlor in Iola and in Chanute. And uh, Bob, who was a reporter for Kansas City Paper, lives in Kansas City now. We keep in touch quite often. And David, David is still there. Okay, mm -hmm. David works part time at the Brenner Funeral Home, and he lived. Uh, he lives at the. Uh, not, Oakview Estates. What's the name of it? Oakview Estates. Yeah, Oakview, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, Dan's sick, and he's down in... Dan, I, no, I don't... He's, he was Joe's kid, yeah, yeah Joe, Joe's kid. kid. And, his, and Jim, one of his brothers was living down there with him. Joe, Jim's brother, lives yeah. at the house there. Yeah, okay. Now, is that house anyway associated with the house you were talking about? No. He lives right there by where Monica Kellogg is, right off, right in front there. Right, right behind the Raider Express. Oh, I don't know. That's Joe's house. That's Joe's house? Oh, oh. oh Joe's house. That's okay. Joe's house. Yeah, sure, of course. Now, I want to tell you a thing about, about Joe. I was not very happy with him at one point because he was responsible for getting Depot Street changed to Lynn. Mm -hmm. He was a councilman at the time, and I guess, I don't know, maybe Joe thought the name wasn't elegant enough. I don't know. Why? Know why? why? No, I don't know why. I can't figure out why they do that. I don't know because Depot Street is Depot Street. Yeah. The bus car is now where the depot was. The bus bar, right? Yeah, right. That's yeah. where the depot yeah. was. Yeah. Blocked off. Yeah, blocked off. Used to go down there. Yeah. Because I remember going down past your place. Yeah. Past the lumber yard. My dad always bought everything at the lumber yard. Yeah. And going to the depot. And there was a little thing called the doodle bug. Oh, sure. Yeah. I wrote on that a couple of times. Yeah, me too. My grandparents had some friends who were worked for uh, John Santa Fe. That's what they call him. Yeah, they, they, work, they get their money from John Santa Fe. Went from Santa Fe in Pittsburgh to Chanute. And there was a couple of times that my grandpa and grandma drew art, we all got on a doodle bug and we went to Chanute. I thought I was going across the world. <laughs> yeah, it took, it took a long time too, didn't it? I wrote that too. Well, one time we were kids, the Friscals and I decided to get on that train and take, take a trip to Pittsburgh and back. That was a thrill, <laughs> the doodle bug. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, 
Oh, another thing about Myrtle, Myrtle, the daughter, was she was really a good old soul. Uh, I don't know how she etched, etched a living. I really don't know, but she would get the commodities, I think, mm -hmm. once a month mm -hmm. from the government. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't, she couldn't go uptown to get them. And she asked my dad, if, and my dad willingly did it for her, but he was always embarrassed, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't let her know that, but. Mm -hmm. To yeah, go down so, and so, pick those up. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah. anyway. I, you know, it just, Depot Street just, it just brings back too many memories, that's all, mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm glad, I'm glad, okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Are you yeah. Thank you, yeah, yeah. JT? Okay, because, you know, what we do want to have is, uh, Jerry's going to talk a little bit more yeah. about chicken oh, okay. meat, yeah. and then afterwards, yeah. we can, anybody can, you know, yeah. can bring okay. all your okay. questions okay. to either, either person, yeah. What? I want to mention the corner of McKay and Depot Street, P.P. Mangori's Silver Star Bar. Yeah. Because they had the big hangover out front, the big sheet metal roof with the little poles. Yeah. And all you guys who delivered the newspapers, they were dumped there on the corner. That's right. And I would come up after school and pick up the mail at the post office, because we had just had a general general delivery. And then go over there and help you guys. Pull the papers. <laughs> you and Jim Lavery and uh, Paul Rubel. Paul Rubel uh -huh. and uh, oh, uh, a couple other guys. Yeah. But the, the fellow that really I really appreciated was Mr. Can. Remember Mr. Can? I think so. He was the old man with the goiter. Ah, uh, yeah. And yeah. he lived. He lived <laughs> behind. <laughs> south of where the bank is yeah yeah and he would come over there and many times i'd be in the post office when he was and he'd come in the post office i felt so sorry for him he'd say any mail for me today and it was velma devore my neighbor and she'd say no mail for you mr can and then he'd go over and sit down and i used to go over and talk to him just because i felt yeah. sorry for him yeah. and he recited poetry English. I don't, he was a, I thought he was the most brilliant guy in the world. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of characters on Depot Street. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very colorful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, now I'm going, uh, I, they asked me to review some of the restoration, renovation projects that I've had in Chicopee and give you a little background of that. Uh, Chicopee was founded with the sinking of mine number four of the Cherokee in Pittsburgh. Like I said, that was the relationship between Frontenac and Chicopee there. There's both with the uh, Cherokee in Pittsburgh. And it started in 1887 with the sinking of that mine. It reached its peak about 1910 with a population of about 1,600. Uh, currently, there's a population of about 350 there. Here's a few glimpses of Chicopee from the past. There's the main street of Chicopee, probably taken about 1910. If you notice the, the uh, streetcar tracks here, right down the main street here. Mm -hmm. Down here, you really can't see it, but the post office set back here facing right down the main street. I want you to take note of this building over here. That was the Messner and Maury store building, and I'll be talking about that in a little while. The other thing that I want to point out is this large store building right here. That belonged to Louis, uh, Louis Aggie, Azzy, I'm sorry. And the interesting thing about that, I can't believe that we found a picture of this, but he had a trap door on the roof here and he had a buggy seat up on top of the <laughs> building. And it was said that him and his girlfriend would go up there and watch the traffic in the evenings. <laughs> <You know? laughs> is that looking east or west? It's looking east, uh-huh, yeah. Right here, this is what would be uh, Chicopee Street right now, and going down the main street. Uh, down here would be Pazvento Avenue or, or 200th Street right now. I couldn't leave out the saloons that we had, and that's been mentioned a little bit already. This was John Valentine's Saloon in Chicopee. And I've got to mention that this is an upper end saloon, okay? <laughs> it was better. If you look at the, the bar there, it was a pretty nice one. And it was complete, although you can't see it very well, 
it has an odalesque here and another lady up here, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, at one time, it was reported there was 15 saloons in Chicopee. So. <laughs> the next uh, picture, this is the Mount Carmel Company store. Uh, the Cherokee in Pittsburgh in uh, 1896 uh, got taken over by Charles Devlin and, and he formed his own coal company. It was called the Mount Carmel Coal Company. Charles Devlin uh, is an interesting character and I've studied a lot about his life. He was well liked by the miners, although he was uh, a, a mine owner. And at one time was reported to probably be the wealthiest man in Kansas. He had railroads, he had mines in Illinois and Missouri and Kansas, and he also had banks. Unfortunately, his end was kind of tragic. In 1905, he got sick and he ran all those businesses himself. And his investors in the bank were scared of what might happen. They made a run on his bank and he had to go into bankruptcy after that. For his health, he went to Europe and on the way back, uh, stopped in Chicago. He had a coronary and died there in Chicago on his way back to Topeka. He lived in Topeka. But that's why this is called the Mount Carmel Mercantile Company. Anything in southeast Kansas that's named Mount Carmel is because of Charles Devlin that he made donations, whether that's the cemetery of Frontenac or the hospital here or whatever, it was all because of Charles Devlin. So you can see that was a pretty good size store building there. On the, that was on the main street. <laughs> One thing that I want to uh, not leave out here is also boarding houses. This was at one time one of the boarding houses in Chicopee, and it was a two-story one. As I mentioned, when Chicopee was first started, the coal company built 10 company houses and also a boarding house that stood there on the corner, uh, at Chicopee Corner, for a long time. But that's not this house. This was another boarding house there. The first house that I want to talk about is this house here. This is a photo taken in 1910 of a three-room company house in Chicopee. And there on the front lawn is Mary Lejac. She lived there in this house at that time. It was owned, uh, it's now at 117 West Vermilion Street there in Chicopee. And it was owned by Antone and Mary Lejac. And they had come there by 1901. After Mary died in 1915, it was later uh, lived in by Josephine Pachetti, and she lived here until her death in 1968. And it was owned by her son, August Pachetti, and he used it as a rental house there for some time after that. In fact, when Anna and I were first married, we were remodeling my grandmother's house a block from this house, and we lived in this house for about four months while we were waiting to get the other house finished. Uh, what's interesting about that at that time, the electricity was all on one circuit. The whole house was on one circuit. And the, there had been a kitchen built on the back, back there, and you could take a shower in the kitchen when it rained. You know, it leaked so bad. <laughs> so, but after uh, our family started to grow, then we was looking for a house, and there wasn't anything available there in Chicopee very much. So. We ended up buying this house <laughs> along with some other lots that adjoined it and we built our house there just next to this house then. Uh, and we began the restoration of this house in 1994 um, and we had it lifted up and a new foundation put under it because the foundation was not very good. Just to give you an example of these three-room houses, this is exactly like that house, the three-room here. The thing that I want to point out to you about this, this is the DeGruson family. This was Jean DeGruson's family when they lived in Chicopee. And it was probably taken around 1910, something like that. But the thing that I want to point out is you notice there's no foundation here. So you can see underneath it here and over there. It just sets on the corners on piles of rock. Okay. My grandmother came here from Slovenia in 1905 and married my grandfather 
And the first winter they were in a company house there in Fleming. He worked in the coal mines in Fleming. And she was telling me when she was 80 years, or close to 90 years old, she said, the first winter, she said, that, you know, in Slovenia, all the houses are, are masonry houses. And in the corner of the living room, it's called a pitch. It's their stove there, and it's a unique type of stove that's got tile around it, and people sit around the stove and everything like that. That's where all the life in the house takes place. And she told me, she said, that first winter, I cried for my pitch because she said it was so cold in these houses. She said it, the cold would even come through the floor. Well, that's because there was no foundation under it, you know. So. And there's the house now. After that, it's been redone. Same house. thing I want to show you about this, we have not completed the restoration of the inside, and we're hoping maybe this fall to start in on the inside of it and finish the inside. But there, it has wooden walls and a wooden ceiling. I want you to see that because that's really early example. That may be from the 1890s or something like that, that they had wooden walls like that. And luckily, those walls are well enough that I can probably uh, uh, keep a couple of walls in the house in, in wood walls like that. The next one, this is a, a two-room company house. You see how small they, they were. This particular house just set down the road there on the corner from where I live now. And uh, there was an elderly man who lived there and died in this house. And then after that, it sat empty for a while. And in 1985, it was burned. It was used as a training thing for the rural uh, fire department, and they burned it, you know, at that time. But Next one I want to talk about is this house, this blue house. Uh, that uh, was a two-room house also, just like the one that I showed you, but the kitchen had been added to the back there where that back door is. That, that was an add-on to this two-room house. It was first owned by Jacob and Mary Bushta in Chicopee. They had come to Chicopee by 1895, and Jacob died in 1917. Then it was owned by uh, Anton and Anna Polowich, and they were in Chicopee by 1901. They had six children in this house. Okay. I was really fortunate that I got to talk to one of the daughters, uh, and she was about 95 when I got to talk to her. And she said, we, luckily we had three boys and three girls in the family. And I said, how in the world did you sleep in this house? And she said, well, us kids had one bed. And she said, one night the girls got the bed, the boys got the floor, and the next night we switched. <laughs> and she said, needless to say, we didn't spend a lot of time in the house, she said, you know, with as small as it would. Uh, I bought this house uh, from Carl Olson. It sets at 102 West Vermilion, just down the street from the greenhouse that I showed you. Uh, I bought it from Carl Olson in 1983, and I began restoration and renovation of it in, in 1993, and virtually it was rebuilt because it was really in terrible shape when I got it. Wayne and Dwayne Windsor uh, did most of the remodeling and, and restoration of it. And now I, I use it as my office. When I got finished with it, I was going to use it as a rental property. And I thought, no, it's too nice inside. I, I don't want to do that, you know. So I'd, you know, I've collected local history all my life, and I have a mountain of data. And that was all in our house. And I told Anna, I said, you know, I've been thinking about that. I said, I I think I'll move all my stuff over there and just use my office, you know, and put the archives over there. And he said, I think that's an excellent idea. <laughs> so that, that has now become the Chickpea archives there, you know. So uh, like I say, I have a lot of data there. The next one, this yellow house sits right next to that blue house that I showed you. And again, it was a three-room house, just like the green one was, and a kitchen was added to the back of this one as well. Uh, this sets at 203 West Vermillion there in Chicopee. Originally, it was owned by Ludwig Metzner, and he never married, and he died in 1940. After he, he passed away, his niece, Josephine Metzner Wilson, lived there for some time. 
and I bought it from August Pacetti in 1980. And my dad and I began remodeling it in, in 1981, and then we've done some remodeling since that time. Uh, and I used it as a rental property. This is a square four-room house I mentioned earlier. I don't know for sure whether this is a company house. I think that it is, but I, I don't have the records to show that. Um, and I don't know when this building, this house was built. This picture was taken in 1922, and it sits just across the street on the north side of the church there in, in Chicopee. Uh, was it a pit boss house? I don't know, you know. But it, those houses was divided equally into four rooms. It was just square in there. For years, it was owned by uh, uh, Charles de Camp. In 2008, I bought it from Mary Jamison. And then there was a story about what happened with that. I bought it so because of the neighborhood to keep the neighborhood kind of cleaned up a little bit. And uh, in 2012, Carolyn Vedix had a beauty shop uh, about a mile to the southwest of Chicopee, and we had a bad windstorm, and it blew her beauty shop in. And Carolyn, uh, my son was a friend with one of the girls that worked there in the beauty shop, and Carolyn called me and she says, Jerry, she said, do you have a building we could put the beauty shop in? And I said, well, I don't know, Carolyn. And she said, well, how about that one across from the church? And I said, well, it has to be totally redone. You know, it's, it's bad shape. <laughs> And she says, well, we really want to stay out here. And I said, well, let me see what I can do. So I got a hold of Dan Scales, who was a contractor. And he came over and looked at it. And I says, Dan, there's just one condition here. This was in March, OK, in March of 2012. And I said, it has to be done by May the 11th. And my son, my son Yuri and I was going to walk the Camino in uh, Spain. And we were leaving on May the 11th. So I said, it has to be done by that day. Said, OK, let me think about that. So he called me back and he said, I think we can do it, Jerry. I said, OK. So it was a wild couple of months there, you know, getting it all put together. But we got that done before we left. And now it's Styles Unlimited Beauty Shop. And there's what it looks like today. Uh, next uh, picture here. This is Metzner and Maury's grocery store. And this is the building that I showed you on Main Street there on the north side of Main Street. Now, the, on the wagon here, that's Ludwig Metzner there. There's Marcus Maury, his brother-in-law. And this is Charlie Nix right here. The, the Metzners lived in this house right behind the store building. The interesting thing about this is they had the sign painter come in and paint the sign up here. And it doesn't show up very well, but it had Metzner and Maury Groceries, okay. When the sign painter did that, he spelled Maury M-O-R-E-Y. Well, Maury's name was M-O-R-I. And <laughs> after he had it painted, they came out and they looked at it and they said, well, it's wrong spelling. And, and Marcus said, that's all right. It's easier to change the name than change and repaint the sign. <laughs> So there's still Maury's living in Chicopee, and they still spell their name M-O-R-E-Y. <laughs> but they, uh, the Maury's had come from northern Italy is where they had come from. Charlie uh, Nix there on the porch, he had worked for uh, Ludwig and, and Marcus. And when they retired then, he bought the store from them, and he moved the store catty-cornered across to the other side of the street. And that was a godsend because he put a good foundation under it, and that's why it survived, probably. And Charlie ran that until the early 1960s. It's a picture of the three of them there inside of the store building. There's Ludwig on the far side, and then Marcus, and then here's Charlie over on this side here. Uh, that uh, store building it was never. Uh, remodeled inside at all, and it still has the wooden uh, wooden walls. It was in the original like that. Charlie, I, you got to hand it to him. He had 14 kids that he supported out of this grocery store, you know. And I don't know if some of you know uh, uh, Dr. Nix here in Pittsburgh, but that was his grandfather. Uh, 
I bought it from Virgil Myers in, in 1977, and Dad and I began restoration in it the next year after that. And since that time, it has saved, it served as a part of my library. I had a lot of books, and so Anna was glad we got a lot of those out of the house. And also as a meeting place and a record storage for the Chicopee Rural Water District, which I got to mention, Chicopee Rural Water District is the first rural water district in the state of Kansas, second in the U.S. And that's the store building today. The next one is Mary's Tavern that was on Craig Street, and it just sets across the street here uh, to the east from uh, the store building here. It was originally built by Andrew Postai a mile south of Chicopee at Ashley, Ashley Camp, in 1910. And here's a picture of it when it's set there at Ashley, and that's Andrew sitting on the beer barrel there <laughs> in the middle, okay and his wife there with the baby next to him. Later, after he died, I think he died in 1917, they moved the, that, it, it started out, Andrew started it as a saloon, but his wife didn't like that, and right away she made him change it over to a grocery store. And then after he died, they moved the building into Pittsburgh, and it sat at the corner of what is now Smith and 4th Street there, just across from Bo's uh, one stop. And, <laughs> And they ran it as a grocery store. Both him, his wife, Pauline, and his daughter, Rena. Rena was crippled, and so she was the primary uh, clerk there in the grocery store. This is a poor picture here, but that's a picture of the post eyes there in the, when it said in Pittsburgh. This is Pauline here, and that's Rena at the doorway there. About 1941, it was bought by George uh, Papadakis, and it was moved to where it is now in Chicopee. And an addition was added onto the back of it, and it was ran as a tavern. George started as a tavern, and then not too long after that, Mary Smith or, or Mary Scott bought it, and she ran it for uh, to, as a tavern the rest of her life. I can say that most boys got their first beer at Mary's Tavern. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I purchased it from Johnetta Harris after Mary died in 1996 and began restoration and renovation of the exterior in 2004. It also has wooden walls inside of it. And uh, I don't have the interior uh, renovated yet, but I plan on doing that. It still has the original bar uh, and uh, backdrop in the inside of the store. And here's what it looks like today. The last building that I want to talk about is St. Barbara's Catholic Church at Chicopee. And that's a picture of it there. It's actually the third church building uh, of the parish. It was built in 1922 following the burning of the frame church that was there prior to that. It had burned on uh, St. Patrick's Day in March of 1922, and by October they had dedicated the building already. It was amazing that they built that that fast, and, and it's a masonry building and really a sound structure. The parish closed, St. Barbara's Parish closed in 1993 along with eight other parishes in southeast Kansas due to the shortages of priests. Um, I was on the parish council at the time that it closed and we really struggled as to what to do with the building. And we looked at all the different options possible and finally some of the people there in Chicopee said, why don't we make it a community center? It's always been the center of the community anyway. So we talked to the bishop, and he said, if you'll show me enough interest, I'll just give it to you. So we had some public meetings, and there seemed to be enough support of that. Uh, since Chickpea is unincorporated, we had to form a nonprofit corporation, and the bishop then deeded it over to us. And we started out with very little. Fa Father Tom Street, that was in charge of the parish when it closed, he gave us $7,000 out of the parish funds at that time, and that's all we had to start with. Um, we, since that time, we borrowed $100,000 for restoration and renovation of the building, and since then we've spent probably $350,000 on the buildings. That includes the church and also 
what we call the parish house next to it, which we use as rental property. I, I'm really happy to say that the debts were paid off two years ago, and so it's totally debt free at this time. I'll show you a picture of the in interior of it. There's, there's the outside. We, th there was a terrible entrance here. The basement has a hall in it, yeah. and it was a terrible entrance. We took that off, and we built this entrance here on the side as handicap accessible, and we tried to match it to the decor of the original building. I think it did pretty well. And then the interior, the, it looks like this. The furnishings inside the pews and everything are original with when it was built in 1922. Um, when we had the inside uh, redecorated and repainted inside, the interesting thing happened there. The uh, guy that was doing the painting, he was talking to me and he said, Jerry, he says, we're gonna put something up here so you don't have a lot of just dead space here, you know. And so he put these two arches in here, painted those in there. And we didn't realize it until afterwards. You know, like I said, it's St. Barbara, it was St. Barbara's church. St. Barbara was a patron saint of coal miners. And one of the uh, uh, artifacts of St. Barbara is a tower with three windows in it. She lived in a tower and she had the builders put three windows in there to represent the Trinity, okay? And after it was all done and everything, and I stepped back and I said, well, there's Barbara's three windows. <laughs> it's still there. So. And that's, that's about it. So I hope that's helpful to you. If you have some questions or something, we are going to, uh, anybody that wants to see the house, uh, it's, it's open today. And so, Linda, I'll turn it over to you. St. Barbara's, and I know that Virgil also has some affinity with St. Barbara's Church, but if you notice on the mural, uh, Solidarity, that uh, we have a representation of uh, St. Barbara's there for the sudden death, you know, of, 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 of minors, and Jerry was real instrumental. This has been like 23 years ago <laughs> now that we worked on this project, but that was really the first time I had a chance to work with you, and you're just a uh -huh. truly wonderful, wonderful historian. So you'd like to, hey, talk about real history, right? Yeah. We did it right yeah. from the source of Virgil Albertini. <laughs> now, there are fans. You, you, you guys have fans now, so you, know, you, might, have to, you might have to come back. Uh, yes, we do. Now, we have... We even have some homemade French cookies back there and Ooh. different things. We want you to get something to eat or drink, but we'd like for you <coughs> to see the house, even if you just come out. If you want to drive over there, too, if it's if rather not walk, you can drive back over here to, uh, to do that, even if you just want to check it out very quickly. Uh, the one thing is we are not accessible totally, meaning if you have any disability that it requires you not to be able to get upstairs. I'm sorry we, that we can't accommodate that. We're, we're going to try to get... Uh, a, a, like a little video of what's in the house right now to uh, be, be able to show you everything. And we do have pictures. So with that, we want to thank you. We want to also let you know that August 6th uh, is our next program. Uh, she is the director of the Franklin County Historical Society and the Old Depot, too, Virgil. There's another depot reference. Yeah. Uh, museum. She's getting, they're getting ready to do their second Smithsonian, but she did, we, we begged her, and she's coming August 6th, and she's going to talk about, um, she's really good at kind of looking at local resources, researching your home and the people who live there, talking about how you can get a hold of documents and different items in order to be able to discover a little bit more about your, about your family. Uh, Ottawa. 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 And she's with Humanities Kansas, so we're going we're gonna to do that. That'll be August 6th, and we have our, our last one, Larry Fields, who's done some, you know, restoration here in Pittsburgh, uh, the, Fritz, yeah, the Frisco Center, the uh, uh, Pit Craft. Uh, he'll be coming September 10th. So thank you very much. And back door is open for those who'd like to, to, to go out. And Jerry, will you be kind of yeah, waiting out can, there I for a little bit? We'll both, and we're going to open, uh, both sides of the house is open so you can kind of, we have back stairs now so you can kind of exit. Yeah, you yeah. go right through. Thank you again so much for coming. It was a wonderful program. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Paul Frisco's first child was baptized. Yeah. I sit with Paul at nights now.
Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah, oh, great. he called me yesterday. <laughs> yeah, he said he's going to try to. Be, thank you. He said he's going to try to be at my wife's uh, burial Thursday. I hope he can make it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah, I was a priest there at that time. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Have you asked him if he knows why they changed the name? I should have. He, you know, he might, yeah. he might know. All three of us boys served He was a sweet old, but that's okay. It, it could have been me. Well, yeah, because yeah. that would yeah. Yeah. But he has, my, my know, brother, yeah, my brother, he, right, well, he would have been in high school yeah. then, but yeah. he served during I mean, high school, you know, know there, so it could have been my brother Steve. I wish I'd have asked him. Oh, uh-huh. He's got yeah. what? He's and got, what's your name? He's got stories to tell you about Oh, it's true. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.